This is the Unexpected Cosmology. Once again, my name is Noel Joshua Havi, and if you thirst and hunger for righteousness, then welcome. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome to everybody, and including those who are investigating the Torah. Maybe you've never heard about it before, and it's this uh, this thing in the front of your Bibles. It's called the Instruction Manual, uh, the first five books. And uh, people, you know, talk about how they want to write a book on how to live like Jesus all the time. But the thing is, is that Moses already did it. <laughs> Moses already, you know, wrote five books on how to uh, walk like Yahushua HaMashiach. So uh, that's what the Torah is. Uh, yes, we are finishing up my favorite day of the week, Sabbath, because after six days of labor, I need the rest. Thank Yah for the bondage of the nappy nap we're all expected to observe. Throw in milk and cookies and Bible story hour and I'm game. Such bondage. Thank you all for being here. I love seeing the familiar faces come back and the new faces. Uh, I've got a lot to cover tonight, including what just may be my favorite story in the entire book of Genesis. What is my favorite story in Genesis? You're going to have to wait around to the second half of this presentation to find out. That will, that will include Michael and me in a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah. So before we dive into this, and I have the PDF there for you guys to look at, I do want to say that, uh, well, by the time this video goes onto YouTube land, it will be January something or other of the Gregorian calendar. And we will have already begun shipping out the books of the Nazarene to all pre-orders as well as the TUC uh, book club. And uh, so pre-orders will be done by this point. You can order it at any time. It just arrived in the mail. I was able to look at it today. It is a beauty to behold. I can't wait to read. I haven't read it myself. I can't wait. This was not done by me. This is done by Adam Fink, a pair with the vineyard. And um, my, uh, my Hebrew, Dave, uh, is all about this book. He's the one that got Adam excited. And he's been like sending me passages like, dude, dude, you got to read this book for like probably like a year now at least. Um, and then also I'm excited to announce that she's here with us tonight, Pamela Glasgow. She has completed and turned in the final uh, draft or edition of uh, volume one of the of the Psalms in Paleo Hebrew. I have been talking about this project a little bit over the last few weeks, and I can't even I don't know if I can even state how important I think this is. I don't know if there's been anything ever done like this before. We are in the 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 very beginnings. I mean, we talk about like all these books we're discovering. We are in the the frontier still of biblical analysis and understanding uh, because we haven't even tapped into the Paleo Hebrew yet. People are just now discovering this. They're just now learning about it, the original Hebrew Bible. Uh, so I cannot wait to get this out. That will be our February send out for all TUC club members. They're going to get the first exclusive on this. Uh, so you guys can, of course, sign up and, you know, there's going to be the link in this video. Let's get right to this. So this is called uh, this. This first part tonight of my presentation is taken from the Genesis Reset. And. Pamela was kind enough to take a phone call with me, and I was. <laughs> uh, she is an educator, and uh, she was taking me through the Paleo Hebrew, and uh, being the students under uh, her pupilhood, uh, I was having a difficult time understanding some of that. I was asking a lot of questions, probably to her annoyance. Um, so hopefully, I passed the test, and uh, I can make Miss Pamela proud. Um, this is called the Paleo's Take on the Creation Week. And again, this this can be seen in the, um, if you go to the, well, maybe I didn't update it yet on the website, but this will be in the Genesis Reset. So something I neglected in the last go around was making any mention of how modern Hebrew is a completely and altogether different language than the ancient biblical Hebrew, which Moshe and the others were working with. And here I was putting all that effort into explaining the Masoretic, when what I should have been doing is making a phone call to my local paleo expert. Everybody should have one to depend upon, and I have managed to find mine in Miss Pamela. She is a translator of the very excellent The Psalms in Paleo, and that's a link to some of the Psalms that she's uplo uh, uplo uploaded. Um, I always start out stumbling. I'll get through the bumbling uh, onto the website, The Unexpected Cosmology, in case you haven't heard. And boy, does the Paleo speak of a race. <laughs> and boy, does the Paleo speak of a reset event or what? If you thought the Masoretic was epic, then wait until you read Pamela's line for line breakdown. Um, here is the paleo I was speaking of. It begins with Aleph and the 
on the top right and ends with Ta on the bottom left, looking completely unrecognizable from the modern Babylonian Hebrew, if I do say so myself. You've likely heard the one about Paleo closely resembling the Sumerian script as well as the Phoenician alphabet. Most people seem to think the Hebrew either created uh, some sort of variant or altogether plagiarized the Proto-Canaanite script, an adorable prospect. All that really reveals is that they don't believe Noah's Ark or the Babel incident to be accurate. It's essentially their attempt at turning the table and claiming, no, the languages were not confused at Babel. Paleo is the confused one. LOL. Noah and Shem lived in Canaan, as did Abraham eventually. You'd think their language and alphabet, as well as the creation stories attributed to it, would be inspirational to their neighbors. But I am not supposed to think about it that way, apparently. Getting back to Miss Pamela's translation. Just this week, I was told by a critic that I wasn't allowed an alternate opinion on the his story of architecture unless I was an accredited modern day building designer. And that's true. I was sitting in the jacuzzi and I was trying to talk to this guy about, uh, you know, the mud flood and uh, that kind of stuff. And the, the only thing he wanted to know, he's like, you know, if, if you're not like a, a, a building designer or an architect, you have no opinion on this. You've got to be kidding me. Some people think that way, though. I merely bring this up because there are always those readers out there who are more concerned with whether or not my uh, processing plant stacks up with their controller's bookwork rather than seeking the truth for themselves. Well, here's how Miss Pamela describes her paleo breakdown process. It is not a mechanical translation, a one word for word exchange from Hebrew to English. These are actually coming from her words. No, hers is a lyrical adaptation of the many possibilities hidden in the Hebrew. The paleo, the paleo is a visual language. You might say it is written down in paint strokes intended to deliver pictures. Pictures which cannot easily be carried over into one singular word. And so the following translation is hers and not mine uh, as credit goes. So this is reading from uh, Beer Sheath, Genesis chapter 1. One, you guys all know, goes in the Masoretic and created the heaven and the earth, or the heavens and the earth, depending on your translation. And this is what it says in the Paleo Hebrew, uh, according to Pamela's translation In the house, the summit, the chief and first, former state, as a sign, son and heir, creator, Allah, power that leads by the hand. From chaos, chosen power, separate power, cleansed, filled with choice things, behold a sign, the heavens, the place of the names, the space between the waters, and as a firmly fixed sign, behold the head of the tail, the place of running, the fractured lands. What you just read was Genesis 1-1, in case you were wondering. Who knew so much could be embedded in one single sentence? The rest of the Bible is like that, FYI, which tells me the true scholarly work has barely even begun. I had taken my highlight I, I had taken my highlighter and red marker out as I am prone to do and immediately went to work, but then realized I'd be possible word and why do that? Really, I don't even know where to begin in addressing the Genesis 1-1, uh, or in addressing this. Genesis 1-1 would take a chapter and the first chapter uh I'm sorry, Genesis 1-1 would take a chapter just to, to di dissect what's all happening here, and the first chapter would take an entire book. How about we start with the stunning confession and the reason I suspect our controllers have made such a dedicated effort to starve off any interest in rediscovering our linguistic roots. The son is in the house. Not only is he present and accounted for, but he is also the selected heir and the creator of the Genesis Reset. Does this not excite you? Allah Hayam is the paleo version of Elohim, and Miss Pam tells me she spells it in all caps when it is referring to the Father, Son, or Ruach HaKadosh. It is the Son and heir who is doing the work this time around, reminding us of what Yahushua told us later on down the road, that the Father told him what to do, and then he went about doing it. Meaning, he says this in the, the Gospel of Canon that everything he says came from the Father. He hasn't. He never did anything or 
he never said anything unless he first observed the father doing or saying it, which is so exciting to think about. And yes, the Genesis reset is more apparent than ever in that the former state of the earth is mentioned. We are not told who was calling the shots during its former occupation. What is immediately apparent is that the son has become the heir of the house of the Elohim, or the Alahayim, and it is up to him to refill as well as refit the Arats for habitation. The Arats would infer the land, but also everything outside of the land. The land is fractured. Yahusha, the son of Elohim, is the chosen power. It is up to him to cleanse the earth as well as fill it with choice things. Continuing now to the second verse, if you think you're ready for it. And this is what it says. And behold, the place, the firmly, the firmly fixed land, that first chief place of running, existed, shapeless, laid waste, swept clean, vain, empty. And darkness, Chosek, rose up from the deep waters, the underground prison, moved to the surface, and the Ruach Alahayam, as a wall of protection, moved tremendously. Behold, upon the surface of the waters. In all likelihood, I didn't prepare you for the word picture being presented to us. The Ruach Alahayam isn't simply moving over the face of the waters this time around. That is how we often read it in the modern Hebrew, where here it is quite apparent that the Ruach is moving with a sense of urgency and alarm, violently even, to keep the darkness from rising above the deep waters, its underground prison. You might even say Chosek is the name of the evil entity. It is a darkness which can be felt. As I was saying earlier, the recreation account couldn't be any more obvious in that the earth, the firmly fixed land that was, existed, but it was shapeless, laid waste, swept clean, vain and empty, all of those things. Is it any coincidence then that this Chosek character makes his prison escape the moment after the sun is declared or is selected as the repairman and heir of the earth of all creation really i'm guessing the darkness was the cause of the earth's destruction though he was challenging alahim the sun the ruach alahim intervened to declare we are having this not again and really we've all likely heard how a, a writer should begin his story at the last possible minutes so as to pit the reader nearest to the conflict, but this is ridiculous. Seriously, <laughs> could we have arrived any later into this unfolding narrative? This drama, really. All right, verse 3. This is what we read in the Paleo-Hebrew. As a firmly fixed work, Alehem willed, declared, commanded, he brought forth light, a strong light, primary light, light from every direction. And so light, primary, strong, he will exist. Notice what wasn't created in the third verse. Light. The light had already existed before the Bible got its start. Where it was, where it was moments earlier is anybody's best guess. But to claim Allah was going about in total darkness up until now doesn't seem entirely practical, seeing as how Yahusha is the light. Some have suggested that Yahusha was created at this precise instance in his story, but that probably doesn't line up with everything else going on. Declaring, commanding, or bringing forth isn't a creation word. It's more like a confrontation with the Chosek, the darkness, seeing as how the creature from the Black Lagoon has arrived, hoping to ruin everything. It is a declaration of who is in control and calling the shots now, as if to say, he who is the light will exist. Wouldn't you like to know what happens next? Me as well. Originally. Miss Pamela only translated the first three passages for me. They were intended to show that I was heading in the right direction with my Genesis Reset research, which is appreciated from one investigative reporter to another, except that her translation simply ended there. The trail went cold. I was a howling hound without a smell and stuck with the, the cliffhanger. And so I responded in kind, you've got to be kidding me. From some other corner of our flat, motionless plane, Miss Pamela was kind enough to translate the next two verses in the saga and then send them my way so that my research might continue as planned. So this is what we see in verse 4. Actually, verse 4 and verse 5. 
And Elaham viewed, behold, as a signal, the light, primary light, light from every direction, that it was upright and fair, pleasant and agreeable. And Elaham divided into equal sections, behold, as a sign, the light, primary light. And he also, behold, as a sign, divided into equal sections, the Chesak, darkness. Verse 5, and Elaham celebrated. He gave light the name Yuam, or day, and Chesak, or darkness. He gave the name Le, uh, Leilaha, night. And we actually, well, I'll talk, comment on this when we're done. And firmly fixed existed Arab, evening, and firmly fixed existed, uh, I guess, Bakur, morning. These were counted the first day. Leilaha may be the name of another Ruach, by the way. I have commented upon her in other places, such as my pre-existence paper. We, she would be known as the Night Angel by some uh, traditions, though I wouldn't confuse her with the darkness arising from its prison. Seems like whatever attempt was made on Yahushua's kingdom, or even his life, was thwarted. The entity contained... Seeing as how the light and darkness were quickly separated, and afterwards Allaham celebrated his accomplishment. You will also have to track down your own copy and read it for yourself, supposing one exists, if you don't want to take my word for it. That not everything was created. The sun and the moon were created. The former creation may not have had those. Who really knows? The son of Allaham created many things, I'm sure, but the grass wasn't one of them. The grass and the trees would have occurred during an earlier age if you stop and think about it. The earth had simply been swept bare of them. Don't ask me where they were in the interim, a heavenly storehouse probably. Just for clarification there, um, it seems uh, that, and hopefully I will develop this further, that there are different creation words that are used, uh, and people in... in People who translate into English and different targums will say, you know, he created this and that. And it's actually not implying that some things like the grass and trees were created, that they actually preexisted. That what he was doing is he was filling the earth with these things that were in storehouses. The first creation day was epic, to say the least. I have various thoughts on the War of the Elohim as the Paleo presents it, but that is a discussion which will need reserved for another page. The Genesis reset is our primary concern, and so if you don't mind me speaking on behalf of an ancient language, the paleo nails it. And then thank you, Pamela, for your excellent sleuth work. Um, that I, I, as I was stating earlier, I'm adding that whole section to the Genesis reset. Now we're coming here. <laughs> if you turn to the page on page eight, it, we see here from Elizabeth to Charles a new world, new world order numbers ritual. I. Uh, I've been debating this, and I'm going to ax this. I'm not going to present this tonight. I don't think I'm going to get past the censors on YouTube. And uh, I've had strikes and channel threats in the past over any of these gematria uh, readings I've done. And I'm just looking at this. I really wanted to go over this. Um, Jason123 has worked with me, passing a lot of notes my way. Uh, that he hasn't been sharing with the community, and then I turn these into articles. And I recommend that everybody give Ceremony by the Numbers uh, a read. It's like up to 100 pages now, and it just keeps building and building and building, and it's getting so ridiculous. There's no way this is all uh, just a coincidence. Um, it's clearly, you know, the world is run by these number rituals, and uh, the Queen Elizabeth one is pretty shocking. And I wanted to read it tonight because there are things that are coming up in the spring that we should be aware of, like with um, King uh, uh, King Charles and uh, so on. But we're just going to move past that. So <clears throat> I'll be reading now from page 13. This is probably what a lot of you guys came for tonight. The Hidden Wilderness and Paul. If anybody is listening to this and is confused, about a month or so ago, I gave a rather long, epic presentation on the Hidden Wilderness. And, you know, I, I wasn't really sure where I was totally going with it when I started it out. I, I'm more convinced than ever that there's, this is, there's something legit to this. And um, my, my research on the Millennial Kingdom is, is becoming more and more clear the vision. Um, and I think, 
I'm not really prepared to say what all that uh, that clarity is quite yet. Maybe by the time I get to Zen's conference in a few months, I'll give a presentation on what I think is going on. Um, but this will this clear this might clear things up for you guys as well. So this is called the Hidden Wilderness in Paul, and you could find the full report this in the full report of the Hidden Wilderness on the Unexpected Cosmology. I'm going to stop for coffee real quick. Uncovering texts which describe the hidden wilderness isn't exactly easy. It's not like I can go to my local library and thumb through books on the subject in the catalog cards. Globe Earth has done its work on our post mud flood consciousness clearly, as very few of anyone seem remotely interested in pursuing the subject. Such a shame. Supposing my thesis is true, then I am of the opinion that the ancients wrote about it even if its whereabouts is only hinted at in a passing line or two. Found one. As I was saying, that wasn't easy. In our modern world, the process involves random keyword searches, which lead to web pages, linking you to other web pages, which in turn link to other pages, and then another page, and so on and so on. You never really know what you will discover and where. There's a reason why they put an X marks the spot in the unexpected, and I never anticipated the hidden wilderness topic would be attributed to Paul. Go figure. The writer of 13 epistles in canonical scripture, that Paul. Remember those words which were not lawful to speak? He wrote about a man he knew in Mashiach some 14 years earlier who had made the trip to the third heaven. The claim comes from 2 Corinthians, and this is what he says. I knew a man in Mashiach about above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, Elohim knows. Such as such an one caught up to the third heaven. How that how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Second Corinthians twelve three through four. The man he knew some fourteen years earlier was none other than himself. Paul was the person who visited the third heaven, and everybody knows it. Why do you have to be so secretive, Paul? Many suppose the incident in question happened in Acts 22, 17 through 18, the occasion when he fell into a trance in, at the temple in Yerushalayim. I don't, though. It's why I'm not going to quote from it. I will make you do that on your own. If I had to put my finger on any one time frame, then Paul's three-year pilgrimage to Mount Sinai would make for a good contender. That's something else you will have to seek out on your own. I'm trying to advance through this with a with as few distractions as possible. The book we now know as Visions of Paul was apparently discovered while Theod Theodosius Augustus the Younger was emperor of Constantine Noble, the eastern wing of the Roman Empire. We are told of, in the opening lines that an angel appeared to a certain uh, Synegius, a, a nobleman, a nobleman then living in Tarsus, and in the very house which was. Uh, or had once been occupied by Paul, no less, instructing him to pry open the floorboards and publish what he found there. I totally recommend that you read Visions of Paul for yourself. That's a link there, which again, I translated uh, or edited, I should say. I edited the book for Cosmology. That is a link in case you were wondering. I have taken, <laughs> I'm repeating myself tonight. I have taken the time to edit my very own copy. And so seeing as how this is the show and tell hour, it is being shared for my reading audience. And now for the part about the hidden wilderness. This comes from chapter 21. I, I say this a lot, but I like almost fell out of my chair when I, I, I was just reading the book. I had no idea anything in there would be about the hidden wilderness. And the angel answered and said to me, whatever I now show thee here, and whatever thou shalt hear, tell it not to anyone in the earth. And he led me and showed me, and there I heard words which, is, which it is not lawful for a man to speak. And again he said, For now follow me, and I will show thee what thou ought to narrate in public and relate. And he took me down from the third heaven, and he led me into the second heaven. And again he led me on to the firmament, and from the firmament he led me over the doors of heaven. The beginning of its foundation was on the river which waters all the earth. And I asked the angel and said, Adonai, what is this river of water? And he said to me, this is Oceanus. And suddenly I went out of heaven 
And I understood that it is the light of heaven which lightens all the earth, for the land there is seven times brighter than silver. I will ask you to pause so as to appreciate precisely what is being described for us here. Firstly, we see the part where Paul is instructed on what is unlawful to speak in paradise. That doesn't even happen until the 21st chapter. But then look at what happens immediately afterwards. He leaves the third heaven, continues on through the second heaven, passes through the firmament via a doorway, and arrives to its foundation upon the outer extremity of the earth. The general suggestion has a circular ice wall surrounding the oceans of the flat, motionless plain, but I am reminded of the ending to the Truman Show. The oceans simply pan out in all directions until they meet their barrier, which is the firmament. That's what happened to the Truman character at the end of the film. He set sail hoping to discover the greater realm, but then thumped right into a matte painting of the horizon, thereby discovering that he had been in a movie studio all along. It wasn't a snow wall. No, there was quite literally a staircase and a doorway leading into the world beyond. That is the picture given to us in the Truman Show, and it sure does seem as though Paul is describing it in like manner. Continuing. And I proceeded with the angel, and he carried me by the setting of the sun, and I saw the beginning of heaven rounded on a great river of water. And I asked, what is this river of water? And he said to me, this is ocean which surrounds all the earth. And when I was at the outer limit of ocean, I looked. There was no light in that place, but darkness and sorrow and sadness. And I sighed. This comes from chapter 31. You have to jump ahead by an entire 10 chapters to learn that Paul describes the outer extremities of the earth in two ways, depending on where he is standing at the moment. We have already seen a landscape lit up seven times brighter than silver. The ocean still surrounds the earth here, but now there is only darkness. Paul describes it as the region beyond the setting of the sun. I think that's his way of, uh, his way of saying the sun has no circuit here. In both instances, the sun is nowhere to be found, which furthermore tells us that the first location would be cast into the same icy gloom if it were not for the light of heaven. Are you following? One thing that seems certain in all of this, you can't say Hyperborea is being described in Paul's journey to the, uh, to the Earth's uttermost extremities, unless we have the location of Hyperborea totally wrong. The firmament doesn't touch down in the center of the Earth. We are dealing with a land so far removed from the course of the sun and the moon that no natural light as prescribed by, by a post-Newtonian world can be found there. Paul should have been entombed in the darkness. And in fact, he was on one occasion, which we just read in chapter 31, continuing back with uh, uh, chapter 21. And I said, Adonai, what is this place? And he said to me, this is the land of promise. I will remind you, this is the land that is lit up seven times brighter than the sun. Has thou never heard what is written? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Ruachoth, therefore the just, when they have gone out of the body, are meanwhile dismissed to this place. And I said to the angel, then this land will be manifested before the time? The angel answered and said to me, when Hamashiach, whom thou preach, shall come to reign, then, by the sentence of Elohim, the first earth will be dissolved, and this land of promise will then be revealed. And it will be like dew or cloud, and then Adonai, Yahushua HaMashiach, the King Eternal, will be manifested, and will come with all his saints to dwell in it, and he will reign over them a thousand years, and they will eat of the good things which I shall now show unto thee. And there it is the hidden wilderness we've all been seeking. Read it and weep. The land was disclosed in Paul's time, but then we see how it would be revealed and manifested when Yahushua HaMashiach arrived with the set apart. The span of his rule is even given, a thousand years. My critics always neglect that part. They're like, nah, -uh, no way, man. Messiah's kingdom is forever. You're so wrong. Teach the Bible for once. Neglecting the thousand-year measurements. The thousand years is important because something else happens afterwards, 
and hardly anyone cares to admit that the deception has done a work on them. Somebody is bound to tell me that Yahushua said the meek would inherit the earth and that it wouldn't have been written in a gospel yet, thereby disproving this text. Psalms 37.11. Go read it and then get back to me. Yahushua wasn't the first one to claim it. Also, the part about the earth being dissolved has to do with the fire judgment, melted cities, and all that. What seems evident in all of this is that the countries of the world would be ruled afterwards from the land of promise, which is the same thing as saying the hidden wilderness. The picture seems to get clearer and clearer, clearer with every discovery. Yahushua the king and Messiah never went anywhere. If anything, our controllers built a wall around him. You will see more of what I mean as we continue. We're in chapter 22 now. And I looked around upon that land, and I saw a river flowing of milk and honey. That's interesting. And there were trees planted by the bank of that river full of fruits. Moreover, each single tree bore 12 fruits in the year, having various and diverse fruits. And I saw the created things which are in that place and all the works of Elohim. And I saw there palms of 20 cubits, but others of 10 cubits. And that land was seven times brighter than silver. And there were tree, uh, trees full of fruits from the roots to the highest branches of 10,000 fruits of palms upon 10,000 fruits. The grapevines, moreover, had 10,000 plants. Moreover, in the single vines, there were 10,000 thousand branches, and in each of these, a thousand single grapes. Moreover, these single trees bore a thousand fruits. Mind blown. Perhaps yours is about to be the. Uh, <laughs> I'll speak for myself on that one. Perhaps yours is about to be. Get ready because you never really know. It's the way in which the grapevines are described. Read it again. There are 10,000 thousand branches in a single vine, and in each of these, another thousand single grapes. That is a defining character element of the coming. Um, Kingdom, man. There's some typos in this. I apologize. That's a defining character character element of the coming kingdom, but it is also one of Yahusha's quotes. You just won't find it in any of the Gospels. I've been meaning to talk about his grapes quip for some time now, and so here it is. Guys, give me one second. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Sorry for that interruption. As the elders who saw Yochanan, the disciple of Adonai, remembered that they had heard from him how Adonai taught in regards to these things, and said, The days will come in which vines shall grow, having each 10,000 branches, and in each branch 10,000 twigs, and in each true twig 10,000 shoots. And in every one of the shoots, 10,000 clusters. And on every one of the clusters, 10,000 grapes. And every grape, when pressed, will give five and 20 um, metrites of wine. And when any one of the kodashim, the to set apart, shall lay hold of a cluster, another shall cry out, I am a better cluster, take me. Bless Adonai through me. In like manner, he said that a grain of wheat would produce 10,000 ears, and that every ear would have 10,000 grains, and every grain would yield 10 pounds of clear, pure, fine flour, and that apples and seeds and grass would produce in similar proportions, and that all animals, feeding then only on the productions of the earth, would become peaceable and harmonious and be in perfect subjection to man. Fragments of Papias 4. See what I mean? Yahusha did happen to say the same thing as what Paul observed in visions. You might be wondering who this Papias person was and how he ended up with the original Yahusha quotes in his pocket. It probably has something to do with the fact that he wrote the Bezorah of Yochanan. Yes, you heard me the first time. I said it and I'm not taking it back. The person responsible for penning Yochanan, that would be John, was somebody by the name of Papias. Oh, stop it. 
Don't get your knickers in a twist over this one. It was perfectly acceptable for authors to dictate their books or letters to a scribe. Even Paul was guilty of it. Marcus was the name of Kepha's handyman. Papias just so happened to be one of those people holding the pen. Yes, that is his name, Papias. Claims such as this one by Messiah didn't make it past the cutting room floor. No biggie, though, because Papias wrote the first ever commentaries upon Yochanan and Revelation packed with original material. Then again, if his name is not familiar to you, it's probably because Papias was such an embarrassment to the church fathers that his work was scrubbed. Only snippets, such as the one I have shown, have survived. Bummer. His original critics all claim his association with Yochanan, though. You think any words purportedly spoken by Messiah would be carefully guarded by his followers. But the overriding issue, from what I have found, almost entirely relies upon Papias's insistence that Yochanan, as well as Yahusha, advocated a coming messianic kingdom upon the earth, a physical one rather than simply spiritual. And it wasn't Rome. Our controllers couldn't have that. All things con considered, it's amazing that we have the scripture we do. Another element of the coming kingdom, which Yahusha spoke about in the papyrus quip, were the peaceable animals. That's obviously a reflection upon the lion and the lamb passage in Yeshiahu. Seeing as how Paul connected the great clusters with the hidden wilderness, I'm thinking we, we consider the same approach with the prophet's prophecy. So this is uh, Yeshiahu, Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahuwah as the waters cover the sea. What I have just quoted from is probably the most recognized character trait of Messiah's kingdom. Oddly enough, I have yet to comment upon it. Just the other day, I was uh, taking a walk around the neighborhood wondering why, but now I know. It was being set aside for this very moment. Keep reading to the end. It doesn't say the lion and the lamb uh, won't destroy each other anywhere in the world. It doesn't say an asp won't bite a child anywhere in the world either. No, the context is Yahuwah's holy mountain. The lion and the lamb will not hurt nor destroy each other in one specific location. Also, I am well aware that it says wolf rather than lion, but I cannot bring myself to say it. I remember exactly what it used to say, reading from the passage and then quoting from it often. Chalk this one up to the Mandela effect. The holy mountain being described isn't in modern Israel. The Yahudim as well as Yashua were divorced from the land. The Jews who live in it today are free to do so, live there, I suppose, but they are not the Yahudim of old. That the, the scene takes place in the hidden wilderness. And then we read this quote here. This comes from the Book of Britain. When the lion lies down with the lamb and shalom reigns over all, there shall be found the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's more like it. Here is another Yahusha quote, though it derives from the rarely read Book of Britain. And what have we learned? That the lion would lay down with the lamb, not the wolf. I am often told I am misquoting Yeshayahu and that my memory is bad, but it must come from top brass because Yahusha made the same slip up. We're all misquoting the passage because of the Book of Britain, apparently. That must be it. Artists and pastors, as well as Bible students all over the world were reading from the Brits and all along and getting their wires crossed. LOL. A raise of hands. How many of you have ever heard of the Book of Britain before? Let alone those of you who have afforded the time to read it. Exactly. Let me take the residue wherever I find it. The Holy Mountain being described isn't in modern day Israel. Oh, look, it repeats. Interesting. Man, there's a lot of typos in this uh, slip ups. I apologize. The Yahudim, as well as Yashua, were divorced from the land. If you've read Revelation all the way through, then you know Yahuwah was done with it as well. 
the city became a haunt for demons and devils. The Jews do so, I suppose, mostly because they are not the Yahudim revolt. The, Zi the Zionists and their supporters will have to keep waiting around for nothing to happen, though, because the Yashiyatin takes place elsewhere in the hidden wilderness. It is from there, once revealed and manifested for the entire world, that the knowledge of Yahuwah would be spread mainly because the land was described for us in the exact same relationship with the oceans of the world in the visions of Paul. Speaking of which, I am nearly neglecting Paul's visit to the hidden kingdom. He has, uh, he has more to say on the matter, so continuing. And I said to the angel, why does each tree bear a thousand fruits? The angel answered and said unto me, because Yahuwah Elohim gives an abounding flood of gifts to the worthy because they also of their own will afflicted themselves when they were placed in the world, doing all things on account of his holy name. And again, I said to the angel, Sir, are these the only promises which the Most High Elohim makes? And he answered and said to me, No, there are seven times greater than these. Now, notice that I don't think I comment on, but notice he talks about the seven times greater light as well. But I say unto thee that when the just go out of the body, they shall see the promises and the good things which Elohim has prepared for them. That is true. That comes from 2nd Ezra. Till then they shall sigh and lament, saying, Have we emitted any word from our mouth to vex our neighbor even on one day? I asked and said again, Are these alone the promises of Elohim? And the angel answered and said unto me, These whom you now see are the Ruachoth of the married and those who kept the chast ch uh, chastity of their nuptials containing themselves, but to the virgins and those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and those who afflicted themselves for the sake of the name of Elohim, Elohim will give seven times greater than these, which I shall now show the divisions of Paul 22. The hyper-grace people with a communist view of heaven will not be pleased with passages such as this one. Some of them will still read my work at a cautious distance, though most have moved on. I am only trying to get ahead of the rebuttals, and I can already see them opposed to the idea that souls of the righteous are presented with a reward system based upon their works of the Torah. Visions of Paul has the idea that the least in the kingdom will inhabit the hidden wilderness. Correction. All ranks of kingdom citizens will inhabit the city of Messiah, as we shall see, but not everyone will be allowed everywhere. And certainly not everyone will be allowed into the city of Messiah unless they are first purified. Papias is one of the few other individuals more obsessed with the millennial kingdom than I am. And here's what he had to say regarding the multiply system of the, of the few quotes that has survived him. As the presbyters, uh, presbyters say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven shall go there. Others shall enjoy the delights of paradise and others shall possess the splendor of the city. For everywhere the Savior will be seen, according as they shall be worthy who see him. I'm going to pause right there, and let me just read this line again. For everywhere the Savior will be seen, according as they shall be worthy to see him. So this tells us right here, in the millennial kingdom, as well as in eternity, not everyone will see him the same way or in the same matter or in the same glory. That's really interesting to think about. But there is this distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and that, that of those who produce sixtyfold and that of those who produce thirtyfold. For the first will be taken up into the heavens, the second class will dwell in paradise, and the last will inhabit the city. And that on this account, Yahuwah said, in my father's house are many mansions. You'll canon 14.2. For all things belong to Elohim, who supplies all with a suitable dwelling place, even as his word says, that a share is given to all by the father, according as each one is or shall be worthy. And this is the couch in which they shall recline who feast, being invited to the wedding. He quotes uh, uh, Matthew 22.10. The presbyters, the disciples of the apostles, say that this is the gradation and arrangement of those who are saved, and that they advance through steps of this nature, and that moreover, 
they ascend through the Ruach to the Son and through the Son to the Father. That's really interesting uh, that we are all given the free gift of the Ruach. The Ruach leads us to the Son and then the Son to the Father. But uh, not everyone is going to go with the Son to the Father in the same glory. And that in due time, the Son will yield up his work to the Father. That's the end of the kingdom, the new kingdom, even as it is said by the apostle, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And that's where we find ourselves now. For in the times of the kingdom, the just man who is on the earth shall forget to die. But when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto, unto him, then shall the son also himself be subjected unto him that put all things under him, that Elohim may be all in all. So what he's saying is that when Satan is finally destroyed um, and death itself is thrown into the lake of fire, then he will hand the scepter, the crown, the authority back to the father and the father will rule. So in that regard, you can't necessarily say the kingdom is forever. It is forever, but there's going to be a change of um, of um, of kings. <clears throat> when mentioning earlier how Papias had written down the gospel which bears Yochanan's name, I had failed to mention that he was a friend and contemporary of Polycarp. Polycarp, of course, was a disciple of Yochanan, but then Papias obsessively tracked down the other known disciples of the Twelve so as to interview them. What we learn in all of this is that there was a consistent view across the board regarding eternal rewards, dependent, of course, on how set apart one truly was in their lifetime. Those who, uh, those who with the best tasting fruit, those who have the best tasting fruit, would have access to the highest of heavens. Those who win the second place silver are allowed to dwell in paradise, and then there are those who cross the finish line. They will, uh, in the very least, inhabit the city. Which city are we talking about? New Jerusalem or the city of Messiah? Both is my best guess, seeing as how the smaller Jerusalem is intended as an earthly reflection of the city above. Again, and, and this is all guesswork. I am under the impression that the kings and priests of the Millennial Kingdom, those who were chosen to rule over men upon the earth, had achieved the highest ranking. In the very least, Paul wasn't joking when he compared our spiritual journey to a race. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but receive the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible, uh, corruptible crown, but we incorruptible. What is the point in even running a race if participation prizes are handed out equally to everyone afterwards? That can't be, seeing as how Paul has already explained that not everyone who runs receives the prize. Why use the analogy to begin with if nothing about the running of a race lines up with our spiritual reality? Paul might as well have said, nap instead. Take a nap and we'll all receive a prize. Sleepy sleep time. He furthermore, he furthermore describes the man who strives, and he is a master of temperance in all things. You will tell me you're not really into heavy crowns or fancy clothing anyways. How about running to receive an all-access pass, then, rather than general admission? And then there are passages such as this one. This also comes from 1 Corinthians. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abides which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. How about running the race in such a manner so that all of our works aren't burnt up in the fire? Even in Paul's thinking, the works of an unfruitful soul will be burned in the end. Thus, another hyper-grace myth is tossed into the coffin. Eternity will be inhabited by the set apart who manage unfathomable, unfathomable wealth, but also by those who only arrive with a garment to show for their efforts. Every other work on the earth has been burned in the fire. What sort of goals have you set for your retirement? Just so you know, 
That is all I can find on the hidden wilderness in the visions of Paul. It was short and brief, but educational all the same and totally worth it in every regard. We learned something, though I am not through with the lecture quite yet. There are 51 chapters to the book in total, and so you can see there is plenty of content on either side of this spectacular find. Paul has shown any number of locations, including Paradise and Sheol. Those are dishes best served, however, with another cosmological supper, particularly since they're not what you signed up for. The only problem with ending the discourse here is that somebody is bound to pick up visions for himself and read what follows immediately afterwards. It is nothing scandalous, though it may very well be deemed as fuel for argument by my detractors. I have nothing to hide, and so an explanation is probably in order. Reading further, this comes from still in chapter 22. And then he took me up from that place where I saw these things, and behold, a river and its waters were greatly, uh, were greatly wider than milk. And I said to the angel, what is this? And he said to me, this is the uh, Akarusian Lake. Akarusian Lake? Where is the city of Messiah? But not every man is permitted to enter that city. For this is the journey which leads to Elohim. And if, ev if anyone is a fornicator and impious and is converted and shall repent and do fruits worthy of repentance, at first indeed, when he shall have gone out of the body, he has led and adores Elohim. And thence, by command of Yahuwah, he is delivered to the angel Michael, and he has baptized him in the lake, in the Akerusian lake. Thus he leads them into the city of Messiah alongside of those who have never sinned. But I wondered and blessed Yahuwah Elohim for all the things which I saw. And again, I'll, I'll be talking about this, but I went into great deal, detail in my paper, the a tale of two Jerusalems, uh, about how there are two Jerusalems, and one of them you're required to go to, and it can't possibly be New Jerusalem because this says right here, not everyone's going to be allowed into it. So that's a problem if you're cursed for not being able to go into it, but you're supposed to go into it. I was, a shock, I was as shocked and pleased as some of you to read about the so-called city of Messiah immediately preceding the hidden wilderness discussion. Visions of Paul is packed with all sorts of surprises. I, wish, I really should just read the whole book to you guys one night. On that note, I probably wasn't even able to finish reading the 22nd chapter before my critics started off on their victory parade, seeing as how New Yerushalayim has just made an appearance. Yes, this is New Yerushalayim being described, and there is no reason to fight it. Calling it the City of Messiah creates further connotations from what, has, from what was previously described regarding the thousand years. Regardless, I have already shown how there are two Jerusalems during the Millennial Kingdom, one in heaven and another on earth. The confusion is understood. The earthly city, as well as its temple complex, was expected to be built after Messiah arrived and with the exclusive purpose of being a smaller representation of new Yerushalayim in the third heaven, yet still impressive in scope. I believe it's like 14 square miles as opposed to 1,400. As you can see, one is larger than the other. The, no, the number one argument put forward by the detractors is that new Yerushalayim comes down at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom rather than afterwards. I feel as though I have shown the error in this line of thought, but assuming that is the case, the, the Millennial Kingdom hadn't even begun yet when Paul visited the Lost Continent. And so if the city of Messiah is new Yerushalayim and it had already arrived, then nobody else saw it descend, nor did they receive the memo. That would make us both wrong in this argument. New Yerushalayim has been here upon the earth all along, apparently, and that can't very well be right. There must be something else going on then. Even if Paul is saying New Yerushalayim descends to, to the earth at the beginning of the reign rather than afterwards, though let's be clear, he never once mentions it descending at any given moment, it doesn't matter either way. As the wilderness with its city was hidden from the people in Paul's day, and it is hidden from us today. New Jerusalem could very well be on the earth at present, tucked away in the hidden wilderness, though I say that isn't the case. It's why we must recall that Paul was only given a vision. Notice the transition in the text. And then he took me up from that place 
where I saw these things and beheld or and behold. It's the same thing as saying after these things. He was taken to the hidden wilderness and told it would be known during the thousand years and then shown another event of importance afterwards. One might even imagine the angel carried Paul to a completely different location in the earth or the cosmos, maybe even heaven, which has been, which has been the trend anyways. And I am bound to think this way, uh, that the, the book jumps all over the, the cosmos. He doesn't stay in one place for too long. It's similar to Enoch. The, uh, the <clears throat> Akarusian Lake is our clue, and forgive me for mispronouncing that. The Akarusia is a body of water familiar to Greek mythology connecting the earth to the underworld. Such associations will immediately discount the visions of Paul as something pagan in the minds of many. Try not to forget that the that Tartarus springs up in Second Peter. Was it original to the text? Was either of the two names original to their parent text? I haven't the faintest clue. My KJV is a serial abuser of the pagan hell word, and I know for certain somebody swapped that out with Sheol or any other number of locations like Gehenna. Doesn't make the Bible pagan. The Akarusia Lake is mentioned in many texts, including First Adam and Eve and Revelation. In those other instances, it is referred to as a sea of glass. Otherwise, it is only mentioned by name in a scarce few uh, texts, and here is one of them. I found one. This comes from the Book of Adam, which, again, is not to be confused with First and Second Adam and Eve. As Seth was telling that to Chua, that would be Eve, at once a great angel blew the trumpet, and all the angels who were prostrated on their faces stood up again. They besought Adam and cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed is Elohim, by all blessing, you pardoned the protoplast. And when the angels had said these words, one of the six-winged seraphs was sent towards me. He took Adam to the lake of Acheron, there it is, and he dipped him in it three times. Then he let, <laughs> I guess there's your baptism right there, maybe we're supposed to dip three times instead of once. Then he led him back before Elohim, and Adam remained prostrate on his face for three hours. And after that, Elohim stretched out his hand from his throne, raised Adam up, and gave him to Michael, or Michael. And he told him, take him to the third heaven, to paradise, and set him before the altar until the day of the oikonomia, which I contemplate concerning all the fleshy beings with my well-beloved son. There it is again, the Akarusian Lake. And what do we see is happening? The same thing is what is being recorded in Visions of Paul. Only Adam is the dead soul being referred to on the first go-around. By the command of Yahuwah, the righteous soul is delivered to the angel Mikael and baptized in the said location before he can be led into the city of Messiah. Mikael, or Michael, is a busy fellow. Let's not get distracted, though. From Acheron parts ways with the Greek bards in that the lake or the river or the sea, as it is also known, is situated just outside of Yerushalayim in heaven, or New Yerushalayim. I am putting all options on the table. One of them involves a literal lake in the furthest extremities of the earth that one must cross before ascending upwards to the firmament to heaven. That very well may be the case now that I think further upon it. Nearly, uh, ne nearly every account regarding the land of promise involves an uncrossable river, and this very well may be it. Okay, so that's all I have on this tonight. Hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, that addition to, well, both additions to the Genesis Reset using the Paleo Hebrew, but also the Hidden Wilderness. And just as a preview, uh, I actually found another book. I'm not going to tell you which one it is at the moment, uh, but, but yet another book, another ancient book. And the scholars cannot decide whether it belongs to Judaism or Christianity, which really excites me when they can't do that, when it's so blended together, it's like they don't know. But it's all about the hidden wilderness, and it will actually address more of questions we have. So, um, yeah, uh, Nikki, I never really read this book until recently either. And uh, there's all sorts of gems in it. <laughs> uh, 
I'll be actually talking more about this book next week uh, when I give my next lecture or my next talk. But um, it's interesting that the tormenting angels uh, in Visions of Paul, they have a name. Are you guys ready for this? They're called the Tartarians. <laughs> 